like share and comment on our videos and press the bell icon to never miss an update from rouse eyes subscribe to the only official telegram channel of rouse eyes study circle hello and welcome to daily news simplified an answer to what why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of upsc civil services examination today we have taken up daily edition of the hindu newspaper dated 18th of march 2021 the articles which we are going to cover today are displayed on the screen let us now begin the discussion so prelims is just around the corner and we know that testing is an essential part of the preparation and so just like past years rao's ias study circle has come up with pre parikshan which will be all india mock of gs1 paper and the first test of pre parikshan will be held from 19th to 21st of march the result shall be announced on 22nd of march and this is going to be absolutely free for everyone a unique feature of pre parikshan 2021 is the scholarships 100% scholarships for pts and qip 2021 for top 50 test takers and 50% scholarship for prelims test series and qip 2021 for next 100 test takers the test will be conducted in an online fashion and all those who are already members of e-learn need not register again you can straight away attempt the test when it is visible to you in your account but if you are not a member you just have to register yourself on e-learn platform the link to which shall be provided in the description of the video along with the results of the test you are going to get all india ranking question level analysis to identify strong and weak areas the comparative analysis of your marks with that of average and top performance and that shall be followed up with live online test discussion so compete in all india pre parikshan 2021 and check your preparation 3 months before the examination so the weekly mains assignment has already been uploaded on our e learn platform the question for this week is identify the reasons for the increase in human elephant conflict and suggest measures to minimize the problem you have to write the answer in 250 words and all those who upload the answers by saturday will get their answers evaluated for free from rao's is faculties the link to this particular question is there in the description of the video so the first news which we'll take up today appears on page number 6 in the form of editorial aligning a missile deal with destination manila So earlier this month India and Philippines signed the implementing arrangement for procurement of defense material and equipment procurement. This agreement lays the groundwork for sales of defense systems such as highly anticipated export of BrahMos cruise missile through the government to government route. Now just the last week the secretary of Philippines Department of National Defense publicly acknowledged the intention of Philippines to buy this particular missile and all the events indicate that we are very very close to a final deal this deal will be of great significance for multiple reasons and even though the procurement process is progressing steadfastly there are many challenges that lie ahead so there are two perspectives in this particular news item first is of course prelims perspective for that we will look into a previous year question to understand how defense equipments manufactured in india should be covered and the next is of course the mains perspective which is what are the prospects with respect to this deal and what are the challenges and both of them shall be discussed in the sequence and so we will start the analysis with this question which was asked in 2014 with reference to agni 4 missile which one of the following statements is are correct statement 1 it is a surface to surface missile which is of course true agni and prithvi both are surface to surface missiles statement 2 it is fueled by liquid propellant only statement 2 is it is fueled by liquid propellants only now this statement is incorrect because agni 4 has two which stages of solid propellants now statement 3 is it can deliver 1 ton nuclear warhead about 7500 km away whereas we know that agni 4 as the name suggests has a range of around 4000 km and not 7500 km which is incorrect leading us to the right answer a one only So what we can see from this previous year question is that as far as missiles or any other defense equipment in general is concerned we have to know about some of the characteristic features of that particular equipment in case of missiles it becomes important for us to know whether it is a ballistic or a cruise missile whether it is surface to surface or surface to air it, what kind of fuel does it uses and what is the range and the capacity of the warhead which it can carry so starting with very very basic starting with the name brahmos which is a combination of names of 
Brahmaputra and Moskva, both prominent rivers of India and Russia respectively. It has been designed, developed and produced by Brahmos Aerospace, which is a joint venture company set up by DRDO, which is Indian, and Russian defense equipment manufacturer Mashintronia. Now, as far as versions of this particular missile is concerned, there are various versions of Brahmos, including those which can be fired from land, warships, submarines, as well as from fighter aircraft, especially Sukhoi 30. All of these stages have been developed and successfully tested in the past. Now, just like the Agni missile, there are two stages in Brahmos. So, we know that these missiles are just like rockets and they use fuel in order to travel a distance between point A and B. And you can say that these stages, either two or three depending upon the missile, are the sequence in which these fuels will be used. Because they travel at a very high speed and they travel a long distance, they need a lot of fuel. And so the first stage of Brahmos missile is a solid propellant booster. So it is a solid fuel. And the second stage is liquid ramjet. Now what is this ramjet? Now we'll understand this ramjet concept in a while because it is very very important for prelims science and technology section. As far as the speed of Brahmos missile is concerned, it has a maximum speed of 2.8 Mach. So 2.8 Mach means that this particular missile travels at a speed which is 2.8 times that of speed of sound. And so the most important significance lies in this fact. It is difficult to intercept by surface to air missiles currently deployed from warships across the world. Because it has such a high speed, once you launch it, none of the other missiles currently deployed or most of the other missiles currently deployed cannot match up with the speed and so this is going to be very very effective in destroying enemy assets. So this was so far information but there are three important concepts which are very very important from Prelim's perspective. Brahmos is a cruise missile which is also a fire and forget missile and it uses ramjet technology in its second stage and it is important for us to understand these concepts and so that we are going to do now. And so when we frequently notice news related to missiles, we often see these terms ballistic and cruise missiles. And so once and for all, let us just clear these concepts. Starting with a ballistic missile, which follows a ballistic trajectory to deliver one or more warheads on a predetermined target. So a ballistic trajectory is the path of an object that is launched but has no active propulsion during its actual flight. These weapons are guided only during relatively brief periods of flight. Consequently, the trajectory is fully determined by a given initial velocity, effects of gravity, air resistance and motion of Earth, the same Coriolis force which impacts the wind and ocean currents. And as you can see on the screen, the active guidance is functioning in this case only till this stage 4. After that, there is no propulsion and so, once a ballistic missile is locked onto a target, it cannot be changed once it has been launched. But on the other hand, cruise missiles are self-propelled guided vehicle that sustains flight through aerodynamic lift for most of its flight path and whose primary mission is to place an ordnance or a special payload on target. They fly within the Earth's atmosphere and use jet engine technology. So there are different kinds of cruise missiles and they vary greatly in their speed and ability to penetrate defenses. They can be categorized by their size, speed, range and whether they are launched from land, air or surface ships or even submarines. So these are the major distinguishing point between cruise and ballistic missile. And we have seen that Brahmos is a kind of cruise missile which means that it is guided actively throughout its path and it is being propelled throughout. And that propulsion comes in the second stage from ramjet technology. Now what is this ramjet technology? And in order to understand the ramjet technology, you will first have to understand the idea of thrust, which is the force which moves any aircraft through the air. Thrust is generated by propulsion system of the aircraft. And there are different kinds of propulsion systems which have been developed to cater to various demands. But all of the thrust have common genesis. They are generated through some or the other application of Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The planes move forward because the force of the hot exhaust coming from the back of the plane, shooting backward from the jet, pushes the plane forward. So this is the action and the plane moving in the forward direction is a reaction. And you know that in order to generate exhaust, you need both fuel as well as oxygen. 
which actually leads to the burning of the fuel. And this is what the idea behind jet engines are. And there are two kinds of jet engines, turbojet and ramjet. So if you want to provide the oxygen to the fuel in order to generate the exhaust, you can suck the air in from the surrounding areas and which is what the principle of turbojet is. And so that is why you have turbines in turbojet engines which push in the air or suck in the air and compression is taking place inside the engine. And another way to do that would be to move the plane itself or the object itself in a forward direction in such a high speed that the forward motion of the object itself is used to suck in the air and that is what ramjet technology is all about. That is why they are very simpler, very lighter and that is why ramjet technology is being used to develop supersonic and hypersonic missiles. Because if you are using ramjet technology in the second stage, you are not carrying the oxidizer in the missile itself. Now you should note that ramjet technology kicks in only when the speed is already very high and so it cannot be used when the object is already stationary. So the first is that you have to use some mechanism to get the object flowing and once the speed is significant enough you can kick start the ramjet technology which then takes over and this is what is the scenario with the BrahMos missile. So this is what ramjet technology all about. Then another important feature of BrahMos missile is that it is a fire and forget category of missile. And so it is a type of missile guidance which does not require further guidance after launch such as illumination of the target or wire guidance and can hit its target without the launcher being in the line of sight of the target. So you just have to click the fire button and you have to forget about the target because you know that it is certainty that it will be destroyed. This is an important property for a guided weapon to have because if you have a person sitting around the area from where the missile is being targeted that position can be tracked back and that is why when it is not a fire and forget technology people who are involved in the launch becomes vulnerable to attack and they are unable to carry out any other task now how is it done so information about the target is pre-programmed into the missile prior to launch and this can include coordinates radar measurements including the visor including the velocity or an infrared image of the target. Utilizing these information set in its program, the missile carries out the task. So as we have already seen and discussed, BrahMos can be launched from land, from ships, from aircrafts as well as from submarines. The land-based BrahMos complex has four to six mobile autonomous launchers with each having three missiles on board that can be fired almost simultaneously and these are known as batteries of BrahMos missile. They have been deployed along India's land borders at various theatres. Similarly, the ship-based systems can be launched as a single unit or in a salvo of up to eight in numbers separated by 2.5 seconds interval. So which means that it has a very rapid fire capability. These salvos can hit and destroy a group of frigates having a modern missile defense systems. So even the defense systems will not help because it is much faster than those missiles which will come to destroy it. Now recently the Sukhoi 30s have already been modified to equip themselves with BrahMos missile and now here an important aspect is that the range of the BrahMos missile has been increased drastically because it has been fitted into Sukhoi and submarines. Because Sukhoi 30 MKI itself has a range of around 1500 kilometers, which increases the range and the capability of BrahMos missile. Similarly, the submarine version of this missile has capability of being launched from 50 meters below the water surface. Now inside the submarine, this missile is stored in canister and it is launched vertically from the pressure hull of the submarine and it uses different settings for underwater and once it comes over water, then it ignites the stage one. And so finally, it brings us to the main analysis. What is the advantage of having such a high tech cruise missile into India's arsenal. First is of course military advantage. So there are a number of supersonic missiles in India's military arsenal. But most of these supersonic missiles are ballistic missiles except for BrahMos. Since ballistic missiles follow a ballistic trajectory, those could be tracked and destroyed by the anti-ballistic missile defense system of the enemy which use sophisticated radar tracking and projectile. Now cruise missiles gain significance basically due to this reason. 
Cruise missiles are difficult to track and eliminate as they follow a terrain hugging path and travel close to and very close to land and thus evade the enemy radar surveillance. With a speed of 2.8 Mach, it is a supersonic missile. And since its travel path is very close to the ground, it can easily evade the enemy radars. And since it can be launched from a lot of platforms, it provides security to India. It has very active guidance which provides it pinpoint accuracy. And so that is why it is one of the most lethal weapons against the enemy across the world. Since India has developed capability to attach these missiles on Sukhoi 30 Mk1, the advantage of entering deep inside the enemy territory utilizing Sukhoi from where we can launch these Brahmos missile on strategic targets. But this news because of which we are discussing Brahmos missile talks about the deal between India and Philippines as far as export of Brahmos missile is concerned and so that puts India from the importer of defense technology to the exporter. And so these advanced and powerful capabilities of Brahmos not only augment the strength of Indian military but make it a highly desirable product for other countries to procure as well. And we know that exporting defense equipments has been on Indian agenda since more than two decades. Now doing so would boost the credibility of India as a defense exporter, would help India meet the target of $5 billion in defense exports by 2025 and would elevate its stature as a regional superpower. And countries such as Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, UAE, Argentina, Brazil, South Africa have so far shown great interest in acquiring Brahmos. So one is military, another one is economics and exports, third one is geopolitical impact. Now Philippines acquiring this defense system has much much wider implication. To begin with, it would caution China with whom Philippines has been engaged in a territorial conflict in South China Sea and would act as a deterrent to Beijing's aggressive posturing. Indeed, this is why China has been very very scared of ASEAN countries acquiring defense systems such as Brahmos. Apart from this, taking lessons, other nations threatened by Chinese aggression may come forward to induct the Brahmos into their arsenal, thereby boosting India's economic, soft and hard power profile in the region and and providing the Indo-Pacific with a very very strong and dependable anchor which, with which they can protect their sovereignty as well as territory. So now you can understand that how important technological advancement is not just for the domestic affairs, internal security but in order to project the power. But it is easier said than done because there are two very very perceptible changes mentioned by the author in today's article. And one of them deals with the Katsa Act of United States and second one deals with the financing. We know that countering America's adversary through sanctions act has been created by USA, which aims to sanction individuals as well as entities which engage in a significant transaction with a country listed as enemy. So far, Turkey and China have been penalized under Katsa for purchasing S-400 air defense system from Russia. Now we know that Brahmos is a joint defense development between Russia and India. So DRDO is Indian company but there is a Russian company Manistronia which has been listed as an enemy company under this act. And since 65% of the components including the ramjet engine and radar seeker used in Brahmos are reportedly being provided by this Russian company, the export of this missile system may attract sanctions. The United States, of which India is a major defense partner, has maintained ambiguity over whether it will introduce sanctions over India's acquisition of S-400, licensed production of AK-203 assault rifles and export of Brahmos. But this may not apply if India starts to export these Brahmos missiles. Hesitant of being sanctioned themselves, countries may shy away from purchasing the Brahmos missile. However, there is an excellent case for India to receive a waiver from Katsa especially vis-a-vis -vis Brahmos that can help other countries contain a confrontational China. So United States of America might be inclined to give exception to India even for export of Brahmos missile because it understands that China is fearful of this weapon. And the second important factor deals with the financing. A regiment of Brahmos including a mobile command post, four missile launch vehicles, several missile carriers and 90 missiles costs around 2000 crore or 276 million dollars. Ravaged by COVID-19 pandemic, many countries which are interested in Brahmos would find it difficult to purchase it. The cost of the system has been major hurdle in moving forward to reach a deal even with the Philippines. 
And so in order to remedy this, India has offered a $100 million of line of credit and the Philippines is thinking of purchasing just one battery of BrahMos consisting of three missile launchers and two to three missile tubes each. So from the perspective of prelims examination, the specifications of the missiles are very very important but from the perspective of mains examination, the advantages become important. Quick decisive steps required to curb second peak says PM and Modi calls for test, track, treat strategy. And so the government we know has set the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction or RT-PCR as the only standard for the COVID-19 tests as opposed to other tests which are available for example rapid antibody test, antigen test and it cannot be replaced by any one of them because it has now been declared the gold standard of testing as far as viruses are concerned. And so it is very very important for us to understand this concept called RT-PCR. And in order to understand this, we have to go to the basics of cell, to the nucleus of the cell. We know that DNA normally holds information about ingredients that make up a living being. How a living being will be, what will be its color, how it will function is more or less defined by the genetic code. The information coded in the DNA is converted into functional proteins in a living being which is called as gene expression. So this long thread is a DNA and DNA is composed of a lot of genes. These genes decide what kind and how much of proteins will be manufactured by a cell. And so this process of gene expression happens in two processes namely transcription and translation. So in the first step the information coded in a DNA is transcripted or is copied to an RNA molecule which is a kind of middleman molecule. It is like a copy of DNA. So there is an actual DNA thread. The information of that is photocopied into mRNA. The job of copying this information into RNA is done by an enzyme inside the nucleus which is known as RNA polymerase. You can see this enzyme green color over here. Once this photocopy of original sequence called mRNA is manufactured, the next stage starts which is called translation, where the sequence for a gene now which has been encoded into photocopy mRNA is used to direct the production of protein and finally the proteins are produced utilizing the mRNA. A scientist known by the name of Cary Mullis, who was awarded Nobel Prize in 1993 for his work in chemistry. He was the person who invented this PCR technique. Now what happens in this technique? Under this, copies of segments of DNA are created using an enzyme called polymerase. Now the full form of PCR is polymerase chain reaction and here the chain reaction signifies how the DNA fragments are copied exponentially. One is copied into two and two copied into four and so on. Why is it needed? It is needed to detect even the smallest amount of virus present in a person's body. So the DNA from patient sample is collected and multiplied many fold using PCR which is then detected by a probe. Now the question is that this is polymerase chain reaction or PCR which uses polymerase reaction or polymerase enzyme to make multiple copies of the genetic sequence of a virus but it uses the DNA. We know that coronavirus is an RNA virus, it does not have a DNA and so they cannot be replicated directly using PCR or polymerase chain reaction and therefore to detect coronavirus, RNA first has to be converted into DNA using a technique called reverse transcription. Covid virus which has RNA as a genetic sequence has to be first converted into DNA utilizing a process known as reverse transcription or RT. Then billions of copies of these DNA shall be utilizing the process which we have discussed as PCR and so in combination this technique becomes RT-PCR. Now in cases of PCR tests it is the presence of an antigen in the infected patient that is tested for instead of the presence of antibodies which is done in case of rapid antibody testing. Thus detecting the presence of pathogen in the body before body's antibodies form can detect the infection very very early and that is where the advantage of RT-PCR or PCR tests lie because they directly detect the presence of a virus and not the presence of effect of the virus on the body because it directly deals into the genetic material of the virus. This next news appropriation bill gets the nod of Lok Sabha appears on page number 9. 
So just yesterday, Lok Sabha cleared the appropriation bill allowing the central government to draw funds from Consolidated Fund of India for its operational requirements and implementation of various programs. And so in this context, it is very very important for us to understand few of the constitutional provisions. So the annual financial statement under Article 112 shows the estimated receipts and expenditure of the government of India. These receipts and disbursements are shown under three parts in which government accounts are kept. Consolidated Fund of India, Contingency Fund of India and Public Accounts of India. Now it is important to note that it is a constitutional requirement that the annual financial statement should distinguish the expenditure on revenue account from the expenditure on other accounts and so the union budget consists of both revenue and capital sections. And so what is the demand for grants which you will often see in the news? And that has been given under Article 113 of the Constitution of India, which mandates that the estimates of expenditure from the Consolidated Fund of India included in the annual financial statement and which are required to be voted by Lok Sabha be submitted in the form of demands for grants. So there are two kinds of expenditures and another one is non-votable which is not voted upon which is expenditure charged on the Consolidated Fund of India. Let us know which are such expenses which are charged on the Consolidated Fund of India. So all those expenses which are required to be voted by the Lok Sabha are submitted in the form of demand for grants. These demand for grants are presented to the Lok Sabha along with the annual financial statement. And generally, one demand for grant is presented in respect of each ministry or department. Now with regard to union territories without legislature, a separate demand is presented for each of such union territories. And so what is the appropriation bill? Now the constitution of India under article 114 says that no money can be withdrawn from consolidated fund of India except under an appropriation act passed by the parliament. And so all the demand for grants, which is the expenditure which is not charged as well as the expenditure which is charged on the Consolidated Fund of India is introduced in the Lok Sabha as Appropriation Bill. The bill gives legal authority to Government of India to appropriate expenditure or take out money from Consolidated Fund of India. After the bill is passed by Lok Sabha, the Speaker of Lok Sabha certifies it as a money bill and then transmit it to the Rajya Sabha. Apart from Appropriation Bill, at the time of presentation of annual financial statement, a finance bill is also presented which details the imposition, abolition, remission, alteration or regulation of taxes proposed in the budget. It also contains other provisions related to budget that could be classified as money bill. And the finance bill is accompanied by memorandum explaining the provisions included in it. Now these are highly conceptual and difficult to understand topics. We will provide two MCQs with respect to this topic to provide you more conceptual clarity. Then this next editorial, Re-Evaluating Inflation Targeting appears on page number 6, where the author talks about the inflation targeting and why the current approach adopted is not correct. And so we need to re-evaluate the inflation targeting. And so again there are two perspectives to this topic. One is of course the prelims perspective which we are going to discuss right now. Another one is mains perspective which has already been discussed by Baswa sir and we are going to plug in that video after this discussion. Now inflation targeting is very very important. Consider this with reference to inflation in India which of the following statement is correct. Controlling the inflation in India is the responsibility of the government of India only. Statement B, Reserve Bank of India has no role in controlling the inflation. Statement C, decreased money circulation helps in controlling the inflation. Statement D, increased money circulation helps in controlling the inflation. And so, of course, we know that controlling the inflation in India is the responsibility of both government of India as well as RBI. And so this is incorrect. RBI, of course, has a role in controlling the inflation. So this is also incorrect. And decreased money circulation of course helps in controlling the inflation. So C is the right answer whereas increased money circulation often leads to hyperinflation. Similarly this question in 2020, consider the following statements. The weightage of food in CPI is higher than that in WPI, which is correct. Second statement, the WPI does not capture changes in prices of services which CPI does. This is also correct. Services is not included in WPI. 
Statement 3. Reserve Bank of India has now adopted WPI as its key measure of inflation and to decide on changing the key policy rate is incorrect because RBI has adopted CPI rather than WPI leading us to the right answer A1 and 2 only. So now you can understand that inflation targeting is very very important. And so in 2016 the RBI Act 1934 was amended to provide for the adoption of flexible inflation targeting. Under this act, the central government shall determine the inflation target in terms of CPI once in every five years. This inflation target is required to be met by Monetary Policy Committee. Now presently, Monetary Policy Agreement signed between Centre and RBI provides that MPC should maintain an ideal rate of inflation of 4% which could increase or decrease by 2%. That is, the rate of inflation should always be between 2 to 6 percent. Now, such a flexible inflation targeting has been adopted in order to provide necessary autonomy to the RBI to control inflation. This autonomy is in turn matched by its accountability. So, as per the agreement, if the rate of inflation is above 6 percent or below 2 percent for three consecutive quarters, then it would be termed as the failure of RBI to maintain inflation. And accordingly, in order to ensure its accountability, the RBI would be required to publish a report stating the following. The reasons for failure to achieve the inflation target, remedial actions proposed to be taken by the bank, and an estimate of the time period within which the inflation target shall be achieved. So from the perspective of prelims examination, it is very very important for us to understand this agreement, the targets, and what if the RBI is unable to meet that target. A Gandhian route in Myanmar. Now this article is with reference to the recent coup and the turmoil in Myanmar which has already been discussed many times in our DNS as you can see on this screen. But there are two important lines from this particular editorial which are very very relevant and that is about the choice of spinning wheel by Gandhiji. We know that Mahatma Gandhi chose a spinning wheel or charkha as a symbol for his idea of non-violence. Now according to the author. This choice was very very unique and well thought because it represented two messages. First, the wheel was the main instrument to protest India's growing industrialism and that industrialization was based on foreign capital. But charkha or spinning wheel was typically an Indian creation and apart from this it was also a symbol of resistance to British made clothes that had replaced Indian handmade clothes. And so with one arrow, the Gandhiji was trying to hit two targets. And so this is just a piece of information which could be relevant in your essay or in GS paper 1 in mains examination. And as I told earlier that as far as mains analysis of evaluation and re-evaluation of inflation targeting is concerned, all the points have already been discussed by Baswa sir in DNS which was uploaded on 15th of October 2020. And so let us watch this discussion. Now the next article appears on page number 7 and is titled as the RBI tunes in into the economy. This article shall be important from the perspective of GS paper 3 Indian economy. This article is also important because in both previous year prelims as well as mains, questions have been asked with respect to the inflation targeting adopted by the Reserve Bank of India. Accordingly, a main question for the practice from this particular topic could be, do you think that the inflation targeting adopted by the RBI has been able to fulfill its stated objective? Give arguments in support of your answer. Now before understanding the various facets of this particular article, let us first look into its background. As you all must be aware, the Reserve Bank of India has adopted the inflation targeting in the year 2015. As per this inflation targeting, the RBI is ideally required to maintain a rate of inflation at 4%. This could either increase or decrease by plus or minus 2%. So overall, the rate of inflation in India has to be maintained between 2 to 6%. Now this inflation targeting has been adopted on the premise that both high rate of inflation as well as zero or the negative rate of inflation adversely affect the economy. That means the rate of inflation in an economy should neither be too high, it should not be zero and it should not be too low as well. Ideally, there should be a moderate rate of inflation within an economy. Such moderate rate of inflation in turn promotes growth and economic development. Let us understand why is this so. 
Now, let's say an economy is facing very high rate of inflation. Let's say the rate of inflation is above 6 percentage. In that case, obviously, there would be a drastic increase in the prices of most of the goods and services. And these goods and services would be unaffordable for the poor people. So, inflation hurts the poor people the most. At the same time, as the rate of inflation increases, there would be a decrease in the purchasing power. For example, let's say a price of an apple was rupees 10 and now because of inflation it has increased to rupees 20. Earlier with rupees 20 you are able to buy two apples but now with rupees 20 you are able to buy only one apple. So as the rate of inflation increases the purchasing power of people reduces. Further, as the rate of inflation increases, people would be required to spend more amount of money on purchasing the same basket of goods and services. This would lead to decrease in the savings. People would have less amount of money to undertake expenditure. So this will translate into lower demand. The lower demand will in turn reduce the investment by the private sector companies leading to the decrease in the employment or the job creation and this in turn leads to a overall decrease in the production of goods and services within an economy leading to a decline in the GDP growth rate. Apart from that, as the prices of goods and services within the country increases, when these goods and services are exported to other countries, they would be costly. Thus, this would lead to decrease in the exports from a country. At the same time, the higher money supply in the economy on account of higher inflation would lead to increase in the imports. So increase in imports accompanied by decrease in exports would lead to an increase in the current account deficit. Apart from that, usually the higher rate of inflation that is the higher money supply in the economy is accompanied by a higher fiscal deficit. This has an effect on the macroeconomic stability of the Indian economy. The Indian economy would not be able to attract more amount of foreign investment. So in general, a very high rate of inflation adversely affects the economy. On the other hand, let's see as to what would happen if an economy faces zero or a negative rate of inflation. See if the zero rate of inflation means that the prices of goods and services are not increasing. Negative rate of inflation would mean that the prices of goods and services are actually declining. For example, let's say the last year a price of pen was rupees 10 now the price of pen has reduced to rupees 5. Now, if there is a consistent decline in the prices of goods and services, then obviously the private sector would not invest to increase the production of goods and services. So whenever there is a zero or a negative rate of inflation, there is no incentive on the manufacturers to increase their production. This would lead to decrease in the investment. As the investment rate reduces, this would lead to decrease in the job creation. And in the long run, this would also lead to a decrease in the production of goods and services leading to a decline in the GDP growth rate. So as you can see here, both high rate of inflation as well as a negative rate of inflation or a zero rate of inflation in the long run lead to a decline in the GDP growth rate. So in that case, a question which arises is what should be the rate of inflation in an economy? Ideally, the rate of inflation should be moderate in nature. And what is that moderate rate of inflation in India? This is ideally at 4%. Now the question is, how does this moderate rate of inflation benefits the economy? Now when we say the moderate rate of inflation is at 4%, this means that the demand for goods and services is slightly more than the supply of the goods and services. So when the demand is slightly higher than the supply of goods and services, then this would act as an incentive for the domestic manufacturers to undertake investment, create more amount of employment opportunities, increase the overall production of goods and services. Now all of these things the private sector is basically undertaking because they would want to supply their goods and services and match up to the demand. But what essentially happens is demand in this particular case is always one step ahead of the supply. That means always a moderate rate of inflation. Ideally, it should be maintained at 4%. So by the time the supply is matching up to the demand, the demand has increased by 4%. Once again, the private sector tries to increase the production of goods and services to match up to the demand. But by then, once again, the demand increases by 4%. 
So what is happening in this case is the supply of the goods and services is trying to match up to the demand and in doing so the overall production of goods and services is increasing, the investment rate is increasing, employment opportunities are being created, exports are increasing and the overall GDP growth rate of an economy is increasing. And why is all of these things happening? This is precisely happening because the demand as such is slightly more than the supply. That is, we have a moderate rate of inflation. So keeping in mind benefits associated with maintaining a moderate rate of inflation of 4%, the RBA has adopted the inflation targeting. But the question which arises is, has this inflation targeting benefited the Indian economy? Now, if you see the Indian economy prior to the year 2019-20, that is when it started facing the economic slowdown, the RBI was able to maintain a stable rate of inflation between 2 to 6 percentage. In fact, the rate of inflation was between 4 to 5 percentage, which was considered to be ideal. According to discussion which we had, ideally, maintaining this moderate rate of inflation should have led to the increase in the GDP growth rate. But what actually happened? in the year 2019-20 and beyond. Now, in spite of maintaining a moderate rate of inflation, there was a slowdown in the Indian economy which has continued even today as well. What does this show? This clearly shows that the economic growth in a particular country is not entirely dependent upon the ability of the central bank to maintain a moderate rate of inflation. This shows that even if the central bank is able to maintain a moderate rate of inflation, then there is no guarantee that an economy would have a higher economic growth rate. The GDP growth rate of a country is dependent upon a number of parameters and one of them happens to be the moderate rate of inflation. Now take for instance, prior to the year 2019-20, we were able to maintain the rate of inflation in the ideal targeted range of 4 to 5 percentage. But the problem was the banks in case of India had accumulated higher amount of NPS so the higher NPS in turn translated into lower investment rate, lower job creation and hence the economic slowdown. So in spite of maintaining a moderate rate of inflation, the Indian economy has been facing the economic slowdown. So this clearly shows that the inflation targeting which has been adopted by the RBI has not been useful enough to promote the economic growth and development. Similarly, Recently, if you look at the consumer price index inflation, which is targeted by the MPC, this has increased to more than 7%. In spite of this, recently when the Monetary Policy Committee held its meeting, the MPC decided to keep the policy rates unchanged. Usually what happens is, when the rate of inflation increases, the MPC decides to increase the policy rates. But now, in spite of the fact that the present rate of inflation is much above the 6 percentage targeted rate of inflation, the MPC decided not to increase the policy rates. In this regard, this particular article here highlights that to a certain extent the RBA has realized the failure of the inflation targeting and accordingly there is a need to have a relook at the inflation targeting adopted by the RBI. In this regard, what we will do here is we will understand the benefits of the inflation targeting, the problems associated with the inflation targeting and what needs to be done in order to address these problems. As far as inflation targeting is concerned, as part of the inflation targeting, as we have discussed, the central bank of a country focuses only on maintaining the rate of inflation within a targeted range. This was first time adopted by the New Zealand and later on it has been adopted by a large number of countries including India. In case of India, it has been adopted to the Monetary Policy Framework Agreement that has been signed between RBI and the government in the year 2015. So as discussed, the inflation targeting would be able to maintain a moderate rate of inflation within an economy and hence promote economic growth and development. Inflation targeting brings in more amount of clarity as to what would the central bank of a country do with the policy rates. For example, if the rate of inflation is beyond the mandated targeted range, then the investors would know that the central bank of a country would increase the policy rates. Similarly, if the rate of inflation is negative or the zero, then the investors would know that the central bank of a country would reduce the policy rates in order to inject more amount of money supply. So the inflation targeting is associated with greater amount of transparency and predictability. 
Apart from that, inflation targeting matches the autonomy of the RBI with its accountability. Now, as per the monetary policy framework agreement, the RBI has been given the complete autonomy to decide on the monetary policy. The only condition is RBI should be able to maintain the rate of inflation between 2 to 6 percentage. So there is autonomy. But at the same time, according to monetary policy framework agreement, if the RBI is not able to maintain the rate of inflation within the targeted range, then the RBI is required to submit in writing the reasons for its failure. So this autonomy of the RBI is matched with its accountability. Further, if you look at the countries such as UK, New Zealand, etc., which have adopted the inflation targeting, the inflation targeting has actually benefited these economies. However, there are a number of problems associated with the inflation targeting. First and foremost, this disregards the multifaceted role of the RBI. See, RBI as a central bank is required to play a multifaceted role. For example, it is required to control the exchange rate. It is required to carry out the regulation of the entire banking sector through its monetary policy. It is required to promote the GDP growth rate as well as it needs to create more amount of jobs. But what happens in case of inflation targeting is the role of the RBI gets confined only to control of inflation and all other important functions which are required to be carried out are usually overlooked. In fact, some of the critics have pointed out that excessive focus of the RBI on the inflation targeting has led to RBI's neglect of other important functions. For example, the regulation of the banking sector. So as you can see in the recent years, there has been increase in the number of bank fraud cases. Usually it is believed that if you are able to maintain a moderate rate of inflation, apart from promoting GDP growth rate, this also leads to financial stability. However, this particular assumption was actually proved wrong during the global financial crisis of the year 2008. Now, if you look at the years preceding the global financial crisis, during those years, the entire world economy was able to maintain the stability in the prices. So ideally, as per the assumption, this particular price stability should have led to the financial stability. However, in reality, in spite of having the price stability before 2008, we still had the global financial crisis which goes on to show that the price stability alone cannot lead to financial stability. Nextly, in case of India, as stated before, even though we have been able to maintain an ideal rate of inflation between 4 to 5 percentage, the economy as such has still been facing a slowdown. Lastly, as far as inflation targeting is concerned, this can come in handy only if the inflation is taking place on account of demand side factors. But what happens if the inflation is on account of supply side factors? For example, inflation can take place on account of increase in the crude oil prices, poor monsoon, floods, etc. Now, whenever inflation takes place due to supply side factors, the role of the government is much more important than the RBI. Here, the government of India would be required to enhance the supply of these goods and services in order to reduce the inflation. So, RBI would have limited role to play as far as the supply side inflation is concerned. So the question is what should the RBI do in order to avoid these problems? Now if you look at the inflation targeting which is adopted by the RBI is concerned, it is referred to as the pure inflation targeting. This is because here the RBI is concerned only with maintaining the rate of inflation within the targeted range. So here the RBI is not concerned with other important aspects such as the GDP growth rate, employment creation and so on. So, some of the economists have pointed out that this pure inflation targeting adopted by the RBI can instead be replaced by the flexible inflation targeting. So in case of flexible inflation targeting, the Reserve Bank of India would focus both on maintaining the rate of inflation within an ideal range of 2 to 6 percentage and it would also focus upon enhancing the GDP growth rate. And how can these two objectives be fulfilled? Now, according to some of the economists, if the RBI is able to maintain a rate of inflation between 2 to 6 percentage, then the RBI has to give more amount of emphasis on promotion of GDP growth rate. On the other hand, if the rate of inflation is either below 2 percentage or greater than 6 percentage, that means if RBI is not being able to maintain inflation within the targeted range, then the RBI 
should not focus on enhancing GDP growth rate, rather it should try to control the rate of inflation within the targeted range. So as long as the rate of inflation is within the targeted range, the RBI would focus on the GDP growth rate. As soon as the rate of inflation is beyond the targeted range, the RBI would try to bring the inflation within the targeted range. By doing so, the RBI would be able to focus both upon maintaining the rate of inflation as well as promotion of GDP growth rate. Such kind of model proposed by some of the economists is referred to as the flexible inflation targeting. So this is what you have to know with respect to this particular article.